Good evening. Um, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Independence City Council for Monday, May 20th, 2019. Our invocation this evening is, will be offered by Lupe Moy, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Lupe, oh, there you are. If you would please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We come before thee at the opening of this meeting, giving thanks for all that we have. We definitely have been blessed with so many things. We're grateful for living in this land of America, for freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. We are thankful to live in the most blessed nation of all nations of the world, and we ask thee that thy spirit be with us, that we will be able to come to an understanding and that we'll have kindness and have an understanding heart with, with things that will be discussed this day. We're grateful for all that we have, and we ask thee that we will think about our families and those in need, and that we will come together as a city and do positive things. We're grateful for great programs like the Citizens Academy, where we are aware of what the city does for us, and we are grateful, and please bless everyone in this room tonight that we will all have love for one another, and to bless all the citizens of our city that it will function properly and that we will all get along. And these favors and blessings we ask thee for in the name of thy beloved son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Here. Perkins? Here. Jordy? Here. DeLucy? Here. Robertson? Here. Van Camp? Here. Mayor Ware? Here. Okay, um, we'll begin with our citizens request to speak to the council. We had two sign up in advance and a, a few sign up this evening. Our first is Kirk Stobart who requested to speak to the council regarding Proposition P. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Kirk Stobart, President of the Professional Firefighters of Independence, Local 781. I uh, just want to talk a few minutes about Proposition P um, and its current format. Um, I don't believe it, I believe the wording and the language actually really needs to change. Uh, my understanding uh, is that you all have uh, an amendment coming up as well. Um, that language is uh, written a, a little bit better, but I think the overall tax um, in its current format is, is really sp taking money what it was originally intended for and not putting it where it's supposed to be. So the explanation last week um, was a very good explanation. I don't want to go into too deep of details on, on how that works, but you, basically you have local sales tax, and then, of course, you have the uh, out-of-state internet use tax and since this is dropping this is going up and you're trying to capture that back correct so um, the citizens um, have voted for and they were promised uh, the current designated taxes for capital improvements so you have the fire safety tax uh, that uh, buys our fire apparatus fire stations um, equipment that we need police buys the police cars the equipment that they need uh, of course, you have the streets tax, the parks tax, and the storm tax. Um, and all of those things are coming out of our local sales tax. And all of those things, as these, this level alters and, and sales go out of, out of the state, um, these things are becoming increasingly harder to be funded because that money is just not coming in. So what you proposed is under Proposition P is to take the money that was coming here and going out here, now you're going to take one and a half million dollars and pay for police officer staffing, uh, personnel, um, which I believe, you know, everybody here, you know, I don't think it, you can argue the fact that we do need police officers. Um, I've always been kind of opposed uh, to attach a, any kind of sales tax to staffing 
Um, we've seen what happens when sales taxes drop. You end up having to make cuts, and when you have personnel attached to those sales taxes, then you're talking layoffs because you can't simply not buy a piece of equipment that year. You have a salaries attached to it and what have you. The, the other portion of that is going towards the animal shelter. Um, quite frankly, uh, this is going to go on uh, a little bit about what we'll talk about later, but I'll just talk about it now. Uh, this is a business I don't believe the city can afford. Um, this is, uh, you're, you're talking about opening up this whole new shelter. Um, if this tax does not pass, um, I really don't see where the funding for that shelter is going to go, uh, where it's going to come from. Uh, we talked about, um, obviously, all the cuts that we're looking at for um, uh, employee benefits possibly uh, coming up. And I think we need to take care of our people before we start taking care of the animals. Um, so ultimately, uh, this reduction in capital improvements for uh, the streets, parks, police, fire, um, all these things, if you were to take, see, according to this, the one and a half million dollars that, that the use tax is going to bring in and divide it up into the five different special sales taxes that we have, that's $300,000 additional money that, that should be going towards those things. So uh, I, I really think we need to go to the, re, to the drawing board again on this, um, rewrite the proposition P language in a way that if we do collect the use tax, uh, then uh, it'll be evenly distributed back into its intended purposes. So appreciate your guys' consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Grant Watkins Davis, who requests to speak to the council regarding the proposed cuts to public transportation, public transit. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Grant Watkins Davis, and I have spoken to you before on issues related to public transit. I'm here to speak for the vulnerable and the disadvantaged members of our community who rely on public transit. I want to give you some important information about the statistics of people using public transit and independence, the benefits of transit, and the information from your own surveys that show that people in independence want more, not less transit. The disadvantaged members of our community that use public transit are the poor, the disabled, the elderly, and the youth. I collected some data from the American Community Survey from the most recent edition, which is 2017, and it shows that just over 50% of the riders on public transit and independence are li live below the poverty line. The median income of riders is $22,000 a year, which is about ten fifty-eight an hour, which is over $3,000 below the poverty line. Just to compare that to people who carpool and people who drive themselves to work, the median income of carpoolers is $27,400 a year, so about $5,400 higher. And the median income of someone who drives themselves to work is $33,500, over $10,000 more than the person who uses public transit. The percentage of transit riders that rent as opposed to own their homes is significantly higher, 56% compared to 37% for these other areas. 32% of public transit riders have no vehicle that they can use at their household, and 50% of them on top of that 32, have one vehicle that they can use for their entire household. These are just the statistics that they take for commuters. They don't get gather statistics on people with disabilities who use it because and they can't work, on the elderly who are retired and use public transit, or the youth who use public transit. In addition to that, there are many benefits that public transit has on a community. A study in LA after they had their 2003 transit strike that showed that shut down all the transit in the entire city, it showed that in congestion costs alone that public transit saves the city between one and a half and four billion dollars in LA. And that's just in congestion. That doesn't take into account people, the money people save on their cars, which are incredibly expensive, and I'll get to that again in a moment or the money that they save from being able to use that time to relax, become work on themselves, and be more productive. Cars are incredibly expensive. To pay for public transit and independence 
for one year, cost $600 buying the monthly passes. We do not have an annual pass. The uh, AAA does an annual survey to show how much it costs to purchase a new car and maintain it, and that averages to, th uh, to $11,000 a year. And that's, of course, based on a new car. Most people don't have new cars. But that is over the lifetime of the car, you'll be spending on average $11,000 a year. Purchase, depreciation, any loans, maintenance, gas, et cetera. If you take out all the possible aspects with depreciation or any of the costs of purchasing the car, you still get almost $3,000 a year that the average family spends on gas for one car. You get $1,100 a year that is being, almost $1,100 a year that is being spent on insurance. There's over $2,000 worth of savings for people that take the bus compared to those people who use cars. And there are environmental benefits as well to using public transit. Fewer cars on the road, which are less efficient than public transit, is good for the environment. And I know that this council, within the last few years, has passed a resolution trying to be the greenest city in America. Doesn't seem very green if we're going to be getting rid of public transit. You have one minute. In addition, this is the will of the people. In the last citizen survey, 39% of the respondents were very dissatisfied with the amount of public transit access that there was in the city. Bus access was rated the 10th priority over customer service, which has been identified as one of the primary goals in the strategic plan that we want to improve, and fire service. But that is only because people are already very satisfied with the fire service. That's why that the only reason why that ranks so low. Because people are very satisfied with it, not because it's bad. That's why it's ranked low. The demographics of these respondents was richer, less disabled, and, more, and owned more of their houses than rented. So if we manage to actually interview the people that have to rely on public transit, I'm sure the, the statistics would be very different. Conclusion, transit cuts are regressive and harmful to our citizens, particularly the most vulnerable. They will lead to worse con congestion, worse roads, and more poverty in the city. There will, likely be a there will likely be a price to pay for these cuts. You likely won't be the ones to pay it. Nobody's not going to vote for you for the sole reason of making these cuts. But someone in this community will have to pay the price for these transit cuts. And they probably aren't going to be able to come and lobby, lobby you and speak to, because they're too busy trying to work and just eke out a living. So I would hope that you will think about that and will make the right choice when it comes when it comes to reevaluating this. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, our next speaker is Lori Dean Wiley, who wishes to speak on police support. Thank you, Mayor Ware and the city council members. You know, Kurt Stobar gave some really good remarks about Prop P. And last week we learned about the definition of it. And it is this balancing act between sales tax and use tax. And I would agree that we probably need to take a look at where we're going to spend those funds. But the one area that I'm passionate about and that I cannot uh, support Prop P without including is dollars for our police. So I am not related to anybody in the police. I'm not dating anybody in the police. <laughs> so this is truly just a personal passion because of the relationships that I have had in just working within our community. So I've been able to attend the police academy. I've been able to be a part of the Citizens Academy. Um, I organize Coffee with the Cop. I help them find donations for Shop with the Cop. These are all things I do truly with love because I really want to support our police and the efforts that they give. Just this last week alone, they were at Nallen having breakfast with kids and playing games with them. They hosted the fantastic and very somber memorial service on Wednesday. They attended a coffee with a cop where they are open to take questions and just talk to citizens. They were on top of Dunkin' Donuts and they raised money for Special Olympics. 
you know, they do a lot. They are very involved. And one of the greatest things that concerns me with the police is that because of the relationships I have learned to um, or have been able to be fortunate enough to have with them is that I see the sacrifices. It's not just in that ultimate sacrifice that we, we somberly uh, memorialized on Wednesday, but it's in the sacrifices to their marriages and in their time. Um, I had a conversation with a police officer just last week who said by changing his shift, he finally got to see his daughter while she was awake and she's two years old. And so while they sacrifice a lot, one thing that we haven't done is we have not supported them financially enough. There's a budget shortfall. So whether that comes from Prop P and we're able to take dollars and filter it for the rest, uh, you know, call it perpetuity, Karen, because this came up last week. How do we vote on something that gives money to the police through Prop P year after year after year? And I say we do it because they deserve it, because they've needed it, We've been short-staffed. Do you ever think there's going to be a day where we not, would not be happy that we had additional funds for our police? I don't think so. Um, so I just want to ask you tonight, could be one of those nights where you show great unity and a voice and just saying, yes, bottom line, we're going to show our support for our police. We're going to provide them with the funds that they need. If that comes out with Prop P, um, and something decided for a special election, fine. If it doesn't, just by the next budget, let's make sure that they are a top priority for us because they sacrifice a lot and uh, they are in our community and around our community literally every hour of our need. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Dominic, who wishes to speak on the animal shelter. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Laura Dominic. I live at 3525 Blue Ridge Boulevard on the west side. Um, I'm speaking tonight on the job shelter, excuse me, the job postings for the animal shelter that were made today on the city website. Uh, I am the former Chief of Administration at Great Plains SPCA, and one of my duties was to process payroll there. However, the information that I am discussing tonight is all public information. I'm not disclosing anything that would not be uh, found in public record. For the job postings on the city website today, the city is looking to hire an animal services director for $104,800 per year. This position would be equivalent to the CEO position at Great Plains. In 2015, the Great Plains CEO made $100,000. Her salary was increased to $120,000 in 2016, which was her last year there. The Great Plains CEO was in charge of two campuses in two different states and a public vet clinic at the Kansas location. For only $16,000 less, we were paying a CEO to run one shelter. The second managerial position posted today is the assistant animal services director for $82,000 per year. The equivalent position at Great Plains was the COO who made $66,000 in 2016. So the total salary at the city for two manager positions will be $187,000 for one shelter and no public clinic compared to the same total of $187,000 for two shelters with a public clinic. The primary reason given for Great Plains pulling out of the contract with Jackson County was the inability to fund the operations of the shelter. I personally believe Great Plains couldn't afford to fund the shelter because of fiscal mismanagement, financial mismanagement, including very high salaries for the top executive employees. I hate to see the city start out potentially making the very same mistakes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jill Clark. Um, Ms. Clark? Okay, thank you very much. Regarding um, health insurance. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Jill Clark. I work in the Utility Customer Service Center, and I wanted to talk to you guys about the health insurance proposal that you're proposing to change on all city employees. You're wanting to try to push us towards the option two, which has a higher health spending account, as well as uh, it's supposed to be better for us overall. For me, personally, it's not, going, it, it's not going to be good for me. Option one, which is what I have right now, you're asking it to be, asking under the proposal for the amount per month to be increased by $153.86 for a family, for a parent and their children, because I'm a single parent. That comes out to be a 59% increase overall on uh, for that whereas option two yes it is only an eight percent increase which is what you have you know shown us and everything and that comes out to be just thirty one dollars and seventy five cents you have said it's better because the city will donate more towards the health spending account that doesn't help me because my daughter is special needs health spending accounts does not help with her special needs equipment to give you an example every month she has to, I have to buy diapers. That's $130. She takes Insure Plus because she's nonverbal and she has a G tube or a feeding tube. That's $262. Um, she has under pads because of wearing the diapers. That's $74 a month. Health spending accounts do not cover any of that. Health spending accounts will cover medications and going to the doctor. I and as far as the deductibles, I don't know what the deductibles are going to be, but it doesn't help me when I bring her to an appointment because I, she goes to a lot of appointments, but then she also has a lot of different needs equipment. And trying to get insurance to even approve any of this, most of the time they do not approve it. And so, I mean, that's what with option one, I, that's why I like option one because I, the health spending account doesn't help me. It doesn't help my son who's in college. It doesn't, you know, so it's not helping me with the equipment. If you could get it so it helped with all the, everything like that, I would be for it, but it doesn't. And then also in your, in the present, in the paperwork I've read, you're talking about when to close the Staywell Clinic. And I understand it's underutilized and you have, we're going to save approximately a um, million dollars because we, that's what we pay, we donate to it. Where's that money going? If we're, if we're going to save it, use that to go towards our health insurance to pay the deduct, to help pay what's going down. Also, um, there is, give me just a moment here, I apologize. Okay, we, if the State World Clinic does close, what's going to happen with, have you guys priced out, well, has the council, excuse me, not you guys, but the mm -hmm. council priced out what it costs for the pre-employment drug testing, how you're, where you're going to outsource that to, how much. The random drug testing, where do the people go to? Where are you going to send them to? H has that been priced out? Um, also, the people who have gone there, what happens to our electronic health records? Are they, do they just disappear? Where, where, are you, where or do they hold them and how long do they hold them and what are they going to do with them? Because that is, that is something that's private information for us. Also, um, a question I have is, has the city taken money out of the health care fund reserves? And if so, what was the purpose for it? Do you, do, would you like me to go ahead and ask all my questions? Sure, okay. go ahead. Okay, okay, I just figured I'd ask. Yeah. Um, if, okay, let me see. Is it in our charter that our insurance plan has to be self-funded? And if it's not, why don't we join with other plans to spread the risk? Also, does the, how much does the current plan have in reserves? Or of that, how much do we have in excess of reserve, reserve percentage? And if the plan isn't currently healthy, is that a result of the high dollar claims? And if not, if not, what, if any reason, is the insurance fund, why is the insurance fund not healthy? And also, um, well, that's, that's all my questions, but, yeah, okay. but I just wanted to let you guys, I, I know I'm not the only city employee that has a special needs person. And we are, it comes out of our pocket. 
So that means we are get, if, if we're wanting to stay with one option, we are going to end up, if you want us to go put, try to get us to go to option two because you're trying to make it more attractive, it isn't more attractive because it's not going to help many of us because we, aren't, we are still going to have to pay everything out of pocket. So that is, it, that is all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, our last speaker is Linda Humphrey. Linda, you didn't write down what you wanted to speak about. Pardon? You didn't write down what you wanted to oh, speak about. Well, I was shaking. I had Linda write it down. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I would okay. like to speak on the use tax and okay. animal shelter. Thank you. <laughs> After hearing all these uh, wonderful speakers, I think, oh my. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Weir, council members, thank you for allowing me to come. Uh, my name is Linda Humphrey. I live at 1700 South Lake Drive, Independence, Missouri, District 3. Uh, Norm and I moved to Independence. It'll be 55 years this coming October. So I feel like uh, it's certainly our home and has been. Uh, and I do support the use tax. Uh, I have been around animals all my life. At one time, I raised bull terriers and showed them and traveled the country and ended up uh, having um, three AKC champions and found that so much fun. And then, after our last one passed away, I happened to go out to the Independence Animal Shelter, which at that time was a kill shelter, and it was very difficult to go out. But when I walked through, I saw all these wonderful animals, and I thought, well, I'm, from now on, I'm going to be involved with the shelter and with these animals that needed to be because they were wonderful animals and you would see them one day and go back and they might they hadn't been adopted they were euthanized to make room and at that point the shelter would take in animals from other even from Kansas uh, as um, volunteers which the shelter uses a lot of volunteers I'm just going to tell you a few of the things um, they foster dogs, cats. We used to take German short hairs out, bring them to the house, and then go up to the airport at four in the morning and send them to a rescue in New York. That way we were trying to clear the shelters out. Um, taking dogs and cats to the Independence Animal Hospital, uh, they were under contract for their rabies shots, their spay, their neuter. Uh, they're again taking animals to PetSmart, especially on Sunday because the shelter was closed, and trying to get the animals adopted from there. Um, I would take animals, I, I, not too many cats because Laura Martz was not a cat, real cat lover, but we would take dogs to Channel 9 and uh, show the Independence dogs off to the public on television and they would ask us questions. Uh, marking the animals for the examiner, bathing, walking, helping with adoptions. Uh, I'm also at this time serving on the uh, animal welfare welfare committee um, and uh, have been serving at that capacity since it uh, came into effect in 2013. It's made up of a few members uh, asked from the county and from the city. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the uh, independence is capable of running our shelter. There are lots and lots of uh, wonderful animal lovers that do a lot of work, but they do need a paid, probably, volunteer coordinator to oversee uh, everything and, and paid staff uh, to guide us. 
some of the cities in the uh, state that have already uh, the use tax um, are Kansas City, St. Louis, Liberty, Excelsior Springs, Gladstone, Grandview, St. Joseph, Pleasant Valley. And I truly feel that a lot of our problems financially could be solved if we could put this on our on the ballot and vote on that this summer. You um, have one minute. Pardon? Oh, yeah, one, one minute. minute. Okay, well, I'm through, but I do okay. thank you all very much for the time that you've given me to speak on this. Thanks, Linda. Okay, that concludes our citizen request. Um, we have two proclamations this evening. The first is for Public Works Week. Madam St. Clair. Whereas Public Works Services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets, and highways, public buildings, and solid waste collection, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, Eileen N. Weir, Mayor of the City of Independence, Missouri, uh, hereby proclaims the week of May 19th to 25th, 2019, as National Public Works Week in independence and call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Thank you very much. Tim? Um, our next uh, proclamation is for Mental Health Month. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental illnesses, and whereas there is a strong body of research and supports specific tools that all Americans can use to better handle challenges and protect their health and well-being and whereas mental illnesses are real and prevalent in our nation, and whereas with early and effective treatment, those individuals with mental illnesses can recover and lead full productive lives, and whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen shares the burden of mental illnesses and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts. Therefore, Eileen and Weir, Mayor of the City of Independence, hereby proclaims May 2000, the month of May 2019 as Mental Health Month and call upon the people of independence to join their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing and participating in this special observance. Okay. Is there something here that's up there? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, this takes us to our consent agenda, Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor Weir, I move to approve the reports and recommendations of the city manager. Second. Been moved and seconded. Are there any items any council members wish pulled for separate consideration? Madam Mayor? Yes. 19746. Is this where I pull 19028? No. No. Uh -huh. I thought so. Um, 46? Yes, council please. Members? I guess in 19745. Okay. Any others? Okay. Not for me. Um, Madam State Clerk, will you please call the roll on the consent agenda minus resolution 19746 and resolution 19745. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Dean Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Uh, Council Member DeLucy, 19746. Madam Mayor, thank you. 19746 is a resolution that updates the procurement policy for the City of Independence. And I, um, I noticed that we're upping the 
staff ability, the city manager's ability to okay contracts and change orders from $50,000 to $100,000 and making other minor adjustments. I remember just a few years ago when I was first elected, I think the number that the city manager had to, to use was 25,000. We raised it to 50 and now we're at 100. I personally think that $100,000 is an awful lot of money. I think $50,000 without council oversight is okay, but I think anything in excess of $50,000, these citizens want us to take a look at it and want us to approve it. And it's for that reason that I am going to vote against 19746. Um, May, Madam, yes, yes, Councilman. So the, the audit and finance, I just wanted to respond. So the audit and finance committee did meet, and unfortunately I know you had to be out of town. I was. Karen, um, Council Member Perkins and I met with uh, the procurement um, department and had the presentations, and we had a pretty good discussion. I think um, he would agree. Uh, and we, we talked about this, and there's so many pieces of equipment now that are purchased that are over $50,000 that we have a lot of things coming to us just to approve buying, you know, this truck or that truck or a piece of equipment or a generator or whatever it is. And so this, this is um, kind of the standard now in the United States. So most cities and their procurement de departments actually use this particular standard, which includes the $100,000. So, so we recommended it to the council uh, from the Audit and Finance Committee. So that was part of the discussion. I'm sorry that you missed it. And I, and I do appreciate it. Um, and I know uh, that I missed the meeting. It's just I am really, really a conservative fiscal person. And before I spend money, I want to know what I'm spending money on. And I just assumed anybody who voted for me wants me to look at where the dollars go. And I don't think it's asking too much. I don't believe it's asking too much for me to do the job I was hired to do. It, it, it will not go without being reported to us. So he's not going to spend that and not tell us. He's going to be telling us what it's going to be spent for. So. The procurement policy calls for the city manager, whoever it is, and I have no question as to the integrity of our city manager. Let me make that very clear. But the policy as written says the city manager will report to us when requested. I am not going to remember to request every single thing. Hey, tell me every time you spend over $50,000. I want to know before he spends the $50,000, not after. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Within the discussions that, that we were having um, at the Auto and Finance Committee meeting was also the transparency that would be brought online as we move with new technologies that the real time of, of expenditures would be put on our website to be reviewed by all citizens and work through that. In comparison, um, the Kansas City has quite a bit higher um, number that the city manager can, can um, use at his discretion, which I do not agree with. I think $100,000 was about average to what we were needing to do to help streamline and make the city government move a little bit forward, faster forward. And also, um, I believe it was discussed, and, and help me, council member, that um, we can also have this information given to us at the, um, on our agenda at the city council level as well for review. That's correct, and every, everything that was spent um, actually, the entire budget eventually will be online for each of you to look at each line item and each expense. So it, it won't be just for us, but it'll be for each of the citizens of Independence. Actually, for anybody outside Independence, it's online. You can actually see what each item in the budget is spent for. So it actually will increase transparency, and it'll, it'll just uh, streamline the city council meetings. So. And to follow up. Madam Mayor, to follow up with that, when I was elected in 1996, $25,000 was the a dollar amount that um, the city manager at the time could spend without council approval, which loaded up the agenda quite a bit and really bogged down um, 
moving ordinances a little faster and getting the, the product that was needed for our individuals in, in public works and in, in IPL, you name it, all the departments to get the materials and the equipment that they need a little bit more quickly. Any further discussion? I move approval of 19746. Second. So moved and seconded. Madam State Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? No. Robertson? Yes. Bankamp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Resolution passes. Council Member DeLucy, 7, 19745. 19745 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a power capacity only contract with Oneta Power for a period of time of 10 years. Is that correct, Mr. City Manager? That's correct. I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention that we're finally moving on this. Uh, if I may, uh, no, never mind. Thank you. <clears throat> I move approval of 19745. Second. So moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? No. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? No. Mayor Weir? Yes. Resolution passes. This takes us to our regular agenda. We have two public hearings this evening. Our first uh, public hearing is an application received from Taros LLC for intoxicating liquor by the drink with Sunday sales license for the Tequilos located at 1208 West US 24 Highway. This is a full public hearing. Hello. <laughs> Ms. Eggers. Good evening, Mayor, Council. My name is Diane Egger, Assistant Director for Community Development. Um, this facility is off of 24 Highway. It used to be a Domino's Pizza, then Lombardo's Pizza. It's not um, within 300 feet of residential dwelling, school, or a park, um, so it doesn't require two-thirds approval. Um, but I, we bring that, uh, this to you this evening for your consideration, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone present who is wishing to speak in favor of this application? Is there anybody present wishing to speak in opposition? Are there any comments or questions from the council? One, one question, Mayor. Yes. <clears throat> On page one, it says, under health, will the proposed use have any adverse impact on public health or safety? And it says yes. Just wondered what that meant. Mr. City Manager? Um, I would probably ask Ms. Egger to come back and clarify. <laughs> I think the, uh, the inspector that said yes meant that um, because it's serving food, it could adversely impact public health, but she didn't mean in the sense that it was uh, the liquor would impact public health, that it's an, an important okay. part of the, the business, but it's not going to impact public health. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Madam Mayor. Yes. Just for point of reference, this is in the first district off of 24 Highway there, and I have not received any um, calls or emails or anyone in objection to this. Okay. Uh, public hearing is... Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Madam Mayor, went, uh, I saw this on the agenda. I went out there and uh, had lunch. <clears throat> Place is very clean, very well run. I'm happy to see something going in that, that shopping center. There's a lot of empty spaces out there. And it's, it's good to see something in there, and I wish them well. Okay, any other questions for council? Okay, the public hearing is closed. Madam State Clerk. Council action is requested on the application received from Takeros LLC for an intoxicating liquor by the drink with Sunday sales license located at 1208 West US 24 Highway. Okay, um, are there any other, any other discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Um, action passes. Our next public hearing, yes, Councilman? Yeah, uh, Madam Mayor, last Monday, the city manager presented a, his proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year. The budget he presented, painted a grim picture, highlighted the long-standing fiscal uncertainty this city has faced. His budget, with these underlying issues while minimizing reductions of basic service, 
In fact, the budget increases basic service. I commend him for that. Nevertheless, <laughs> I have heard from a number of current and former employees who have expressed concerns about the proposed changes to the city's health insurance plan. The city manager has informed me that he has continued evaluating his options, and I would like to have him give us an update before the public hearing. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, last week I had the opportunity, as the uh, Mayor Pro Tem stated, to present the budget. We had a chance to present with our employees last Tuesday afternoon and then again a town hall meeting on Tuesday evening. So I do want to reserve the balance of the time for folks to utilize our charter mandated um, public hearing tonight, but um, maybe just to frame that conversation before we get started. Um, we are fortunate to have with us tonight, I know a number of dedicated uh, current employees uh, and many, many retirees who served the city honorably for, for many years. So I uh, wanted to kind of get some information out on our thought process at this point with where we stand. So um, as we said last week, we began this um, budget process with a general fund shortfall of about $3.6 million. Um, that um, largely is due to um, just the cost of doing business. Um, salary increases, uh, health insurance cost increases, workers' comp increases, overtime costs. Um, it costs money to run a city. Um, we also uh, took action last week um, to lower our utility rate by 4%. That will require an adjustment of 600000 in the general fund. And as I've shared with many of you during the course of last week, it shouldn't be uh, a reason to artificially hold up our utility rates to continue you know, subsidizing the general fund. So uh, I don't mean to tack that position simply to say that that increased the, the obligation that we had to further address our cost of doing business in the general fund. Uh, in looking at um, the proposals that we made and having the opportunity to speak with many current employees and many uh, retirees, uh, their spouses, their dependents, um, we, we've gone back and looked at that. Um, the first proposal that we made, uh, as we heard from one of the speakers tonight, uh, an employee of ours, uh, was dealing with our active employees insurance plans, um, incentivizing the movement from plan one to plan two. Uh, many of the feedback we heard was that came at great expense to plan one. In fact, in some cases, it was as much as 69%. Um, I think over the course of the next year, particularly in our open enrollment uh, time period, we have an obligation uh, as city leadership to inform uh, and educate our workforce and our retirees about the benefits of a health savings account, some of the options, but that is a great personal choice for people to make about which plan is right for them. Um, many of these folks, especially the pre-65 retirees, have made some financial planning decisions. Um, so at this point, we are looking to um, modify that proposal um, so that we don't have that adverse impact on plan one. Um, we want to utilize uh, education, informational sessions, partnering with our uh, good, strong partners in the, the Stay Well Advisory Committee um, to help um, figure out the best way to move forward with that. But um, not looking to have those 69% um, cost increases um, this, um, with the budget that we're putting forward. We took a look at our pre-65 retirees. Um, many of these folks are our public safety, our police uh, officers, our firefighters. Um, many of those folks, of course, are very close to retirement and have begun making some substantial financial planning decisions related to retirement. Uh, that particular modification would have reduced uh, the premium uh, split between the city and the retiree to a 50-50 cost share over a three-year period. Um, that did represent a cost increase to the retiree. Um, we've heard some strong feedback about that. Um, we're looking to modify uh, and pull back on that proposal. We did also make a proposal related to our Medicare eligible retirees, the post-65. Um, and looking at that with um, Lockton, our health insurance advisor, um, we still believe there are substantial cost savings to both the retiree and to the city associated with that. Um, in terms of moving to a Medicare uh, group plan, um, we wanted to make sure that nobody lost insurance coverage. We did not want to be a Springfield, Missouri, where in one night uh, action was taken and all retiree insurance benefits were eliminated. Uh, what we wanted to do was move to a group plan that provided identical coverage to what's being uh, received in the what we commonly know as our plan one, 
but also to um, minimize the out-of-pocket annual um, amounts contributed by the retiree as well as the expense to the city. Um, in moving back on those uh, recommendations, um, I will let the council know um, that that will necessitate further reductions on the expenditure side. So many of the new initiatives that I highlighted last week, um, those would need to be set aside. Uh, and that would also still require um, service reductions or operating reductions to the, our current budget picture of an additional $350,000. Um, we will continue to work between now and June 17th to refine that recommendation to the council. But I wanted to try to um, let the um, council and especially um, uh, the people who are here tonight and those tuning in know that we've heard and we're looking to um, scale back and uh, redirect the recommendations that we've made. So I wanted to submit that to the council this evening prior to the public hearing opening. Thank you. Anything else? So are we in negotiations still? Uh, well, I, I would say the, the, the budget process is a very fluid process. Um, if there are, as I said, the, the new initiatives that we put forward um, by not pursuing the change to our um, active employees, um, that first recommendation we made, by not pursuing that change to the pre-65 uh, cohort that we talked about, um, that is going to, when you say negotiations, that's going to require a conversation among the council of um, which of additional services we want to reduce to balance the budget or if we want to still pursue some of those new initiatives, which current services we're wishing to scale back. But um, the best way I know how to say that in plain spoken terms, for every new dollar we spend, we're gonna have to go cut a dollar somewhere else. Okay. That's all, man. Okay, thank you. We will proceed with the um, Fiscal year 2019-2020 proposed budget hearing. This is a full public hearing, so if you are here to speak on the proposed budget, if you would just please step forward to the podium, state your name for the record. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members. My name is Michael Veet. I'm a proud member of the Professional Firefighters Local 781 and sit as the union representative on the Staywell Committee where I hold the position of secretary. The Staywell Committee is a very unique as it's one of the only committees in the city where every employee and retiree is, re is represented. The committee meets regularly once a month and holds several special meetings throughout the year to make sure that we maintain a successful and healthy health care plan. The Staywell's committee role, committee's role is simple, to maintain the best health insurance and fiscally responsible plan for the employees and retirees. In the history of the committee, the plan has only failed twice, and that was due to premium holidays that were taken by the city and strongly opposed by this committee. To combat these premium holidays, plan changes needed to be made with increasing premiums, raising our deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums, and eliminating parts of our plan such as vision. This committee has worked very hard and has been able to add back our vision, vision plan along with bringing the funds to a positive balance. But once again, the employee benefits have come under attack. So I ask you this, why are the employee be employees being punished and ripped of our benefits when there is no need to make changes to a health care plan while our fund is healthy? Over the last five years, this committee has worked diligently to keep costs down while providing responsible insurance options for our members. Over the last five years, this plan has not seen a premium increase, which in, in turn means that the city has not contributed any more money to the employee health care in five years as well. The committee has worked extremely hard to accomplish this by adding the Staywell Clinic, making plan changes, and continually monitoring our financial accounts. This has also been achieved by allowing the plan's high cost claims to spin down the account of its reserve fund to 1.5 times our IBNR. We came close to reaching this point at the end of 2018 when this committee asked for a 3% premium increase. At this time, we were told the city does not have the money for this increase in the middle of a budget year. We were asked by the city manager to present a budget similar to department heads for the upcoming budget year. Remind you, this is the first time the city manager has incorporated a premium rate increase or in their annual budget. Mr. Walker, we thank you for that. To help offset these costs and along with the requested premium increase of 3%, this committee decided to implement changes on January 1 of 2019 to the plan to save an estimated $1.6 million. A cost to the employees, not the city. 
This committee, after careful analysis of the financials and consultant, consulting with Lockton, decided that it would be in the plan's best interest to ask for a 10% premium increase for the 2019-2020 budget year. The city manager has budgeted an 8% for the 2019-2020 year with a 4% on July 1 of 2019 and the other 4% on January 1 of 2020. Last week, you heard the budget presentation from the city manager and a presentation from Lockton on proposed health care changes for the 1920 budget. I will let you know that the State Will Committee had a special meeting on Thursday last week and made a motion that we are strongly opposed to any health care changes presented by the city manager as currently proposed last week. We feel these changes are not necessary as the State Will Fund is maintaining. Why is it that every time there's a shortfall in the city, the first thing to be looked at is the employee benefits? Um, I know the city manager just spoke about some of the proposed changes. I'm going to talk on some of the other changes that he recommended last week since we haven't finalized anything, just to give out some more factual information. The city manager made four recommendations. First was to encourage all employees to move from OAP1 to OAP2, to have a tiered premium increase for pre-65 retirees, move the post-65 retirees off stay well and onto a supplemental plan, and finally close the clinic. I would like to take some time to look at the other side of these recommendations you did not see last week. The first option of encouraging moving members from OAP1 to OAP2 is a drastic increase to the member. Let's use the family plan for example. If the member decides to stay on OAP1, they'll be looking at an increase of $268.06 a month or roughly a 70% increase in their premiums. The problem becomes moving to OAP2, while you, you might save on your premiums, you will end up paying more in deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums. If you compare OAP1, which is, has a deductible of $2,000, and OAP2, which has a deductible of $3,000, there is an extra $1,000 to the member, just for example. Also, you have to take into account that OAP1 is an embedded plan, and OAP2 is a non-embedded plan. An embedded plan is defined as after one family member meets the individual deductible or out-of-pocket maximum, then the insurance starts to pay. A non-embedded plan is defined as if the, family, if the member has family coverage, the entire family deductible or out-of-pocket maximum must be met before the insurance starts to pay. So, you so what you save in premiums, you will end up paying back in more in medical bills to meet your deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. The other issue becomes with the HSA account. As claimed by the city manager, the city would be contributing $1,000 to the HSA. But in reality, if you look at the numbers, the employees are paying the extra $1,000 if you take what was claimed as our monthly premium, multiply it by 12, it comes out to $1,000 more than what was on the sheet that we, were, that we saw last week. That's where that $1,000 is coming from. The second option was a tiered premium shift for the pre-65 retirees. The plan calls for the premium shift of 70, 30, and 20, 60, 40, and 21, and 50, 50, and 22. These members have put in countless years with the city and the mainly focus on our police and firefighters who were able to retire at 55. Let me remind you, we don't sit behind a desk and we beat our bodies up doing our job to protect this city. Now we are going to be forced to pay higher premiums as a thank you for our service. What will we, what will we see start to happen if these members are not able to retire due to rising health care costs? Our workforce, our workforce will become older, which in turn is a risk for more injuries and work comp claims. Our job is physically demanding and we are fortunate enough to retire at age 55 to enjoy time with our families. The third option is to move the post 65 retirees off stay well and offer them a supplemental insurance through Blue KC. While this may look like a good idea, I ensure you it is not. For a retiree post 65, many of them are living on a fixed income. A retiree and spouse both on Medicare will be looking at an increase in premiums of $353.14 a month to move to the Blue KC buy-up plan. This is the plan they would need to be enrolled in to have something similar to our current plan. I also caution you that moving the post-65 retirees off of Staywell will have a negative impact on the fund. These members are paying the same rate as everyone else and have very little impact on the plan as Medicare picks up the majority of the cost. If these members are moved off the plan, there's a good chance that the Staywell plan financially will decrease and we will have to look at making more plan changes or premium increases which in turn means the city paying more money. The fourth option is to close the Staywell Clinic. I know that on paper it shows we lost $800,000 last year, but one number that is not able to be factored in is the cost avoidance shift that the plan has seen. The purpose of this clinic was never to make money, but to provide a place for our members to go to get quality health care, 
provide members with a wellness program, and work on disease management and chronic issues. By doing this, we help eliminate cost, costly hospital stays, ER visits, and expensive tests. It is this committee's belief that the clinic is the one major contributing factor that has allowed us not to increase our premiums over five years. If you look at the public sector of insurance, they are seeing an, on average a 12 to 15 percent in premium increases per year during this time frame. Now we as a committee and working with the city manager realize that we need to find a solution to the clinic. The city went out for an RFI on the clinic and received several promising packets of information that has led us to going out for an RFP. Once we get these back, the committee and city manager will be tasked with selecting the best option for our members and the city of Independence. In conclusion, the city manager spoke last week about Independence for All. While this sounds like a great idea, at what cost are you willing to go to to implement this? The city has always had a reputation of offering great benefits for employees, which attracts great people to work here. If you continue to take away the benefits of the people on the front line, the people who are out there making this city great, the employees who are actually making Independence for All, what are you going to be left with? It won't be an Independence for All. It will be a repeat of history and what this city manager, this city council, and these employees have fought so hard to come back from. I would like to offer that any time if the mayor of the city council has any, request, any questions regarding Staywell, we'd be more, more than happy to meet with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Kirk Stobart. Again, I'm uh, president of the Professional Firefighters of Independence, Local 781. <clears throat> um, I appreciate Mike's uh, words there. I want to, of course, uh, we have had since had conversations with the city manager, um, so uh, we're, we're confident that uh, he's going to be working with us and. Uh, but Mike had a lot of his of the history of stay well and everything that we've gotten to up to this point. So I want to make sure a lot of people in the room haven't heard exactly uh, what's going on. So hopefully that updates them. Um, tonight I'm standing not only as representative of the professional firefighters of, of local 781, um, but the coalition of bargaining agents with the city of Independence, and uh, quite frankly. Every retiree that ever worked for the City of Independence, represented, non-represented, um, and we are urging the City Council uh, to uh, make sure. And I believe uh, the City Manager, I've, I've got full confidence in him, and he is a man of integrity, um, to work towards uh, him, and uh, that we can uh, make sure the changes. Uh, we'll make changes necessary to uh, the employee and retirees are taken care of properly. Um, you know, we I usually get up here and we talk about representing our membership, and I'm kind of going off script here because Mike said a lot of things I wanted to say, but at the same time, um, I, I I truly believe we're going to work with him and get this to get these things taken care of to take care of all these people here. Um, but uh, you know, we Mike talked a little bit about the history and and the employees, you know, having to carry the load of, uh, of the city, you know, whenever it's in financial trouble, and um, it's it's really aggravating that you know I've been here for 24 years. A lot of these people uh, have been hearing the same story for you know a lot longer than I have, twice as long as I have, <clears throat> but. You know, last year we were here talking to the council about, you know, changes to retiree benefits and and the end result, uh, the retirees came in and they, they were commending the council for reverting the changes and, and going back to where we were. Um, they were told that they would keep what they were promised. Um, so, you know, the new hires, uh, as far as uh, that were hired after July 1st last year, uh, were changed to have to pay 100% of their premiums, um, but I was assured that uh, there were no more cuts would be needed. And you know, here we are a year later, and it's you know, without going into all the details, I got to tell you, these changes are going to have devastating financial impact on almost every employee in this room. Um, you know, we we we've seen increased health care costs. Um, we know health insurance goes up. I don't think anybody in this room 
disagreed with the eight percent that was proposed but it's it's expected it's just the world we live in um, you know prescriptions go up health care costs go up it's just the way it is um, but um, a big jump like this um, I'm, I'm begging you all to <laughs> don't bring that to us ever again this this just isn't going to work people you know they, we, we talked about some serious changes um, and like Mike said these cuts are necessary to meet the uh, independence for all um, I gotta I gotta say that I you know part of this plan uh, I don't think that it's gonna help attract and retain residents I don't believe that uh, this will make us remain com competitive to hire new employees uh, you know with these kind of changes um, it definitely won't increase efficiencies um, these people in this room um, we work hard um, we don't have full staffing I don't think in any department uh, you got people out here that are working the job of, the, of what three people were doing a few years back. Um, but we volunteer our time off away from work to give back to the city of Independence um, through fundraising and other things to help this city. Um, you know, in our department, uh, our fire chief was out driving a snowplow, shoveling driveways off at the fire station to save money. So. We do a lot of things here, and the least thing that you guys, at least you guys can do is make sure our benefits and we're, and we're taken care of. Um, and, you know, these people, you know, they risk their lives. Um, some of them die. Some of them get seriously injured. Um, take care of us, please. Find, make, make sure that these things don't happen to us, these, these drastic cuts. So I appreciate it, and I do have all the confidence that we will work it out. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, City Council, I appreciate you uh, giving us a chance to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Jeremy Kenyon. I live at 4002 Woodbury over in 055. Uh, today, I stand before you as a citizen of Independence for the last 10 years, as a husband of 13 years, as a father of five beautiful babies, and as a firefighter, Independence Station 4, and as an advocate for those that I love. Today, I'd like to take a moment to address the city manager's proposed changes from last week um, to our employee health care options. Um, I appreciate that as elected officials, you try to make well-informed decisions regarding the city budget. I also appreciate that it is the city manager's job to try and balance that budget. Knowing those two things, I have come tonight to ask you to remember that each one of those dollars in these proposed health care cuts represent real people, like me and like my family. In order to understand how these changes will severely impact my family, I would like to tell you a little about us. My wife Hannah and myself are both in our mid-30s. We have five amazing kids, ranging in age from nine to one and a half. Evie, Kingston, Maximus, Scarlet, and Arrow have known no other home except Independence. We love our city. We love our neighborhood, Sycamore Hills. We love our school, William Southern. My wife spends her time raising our little world changers and pouring herself into less fortunate girls who have found themselves wards of the state. I've had the honor of being a firefighter for 15 years, three of which have been here in Independence. And I plan on spending my next 20 years serving my neighbors and other citizens of our city. We live a simple life, not a lot of frills, not a lot of extras. We have worked hard to be debt free other than our mortgage. But due to being blessed with a large family and having the everyday cost of living life, we don't have much saved up either. I tell you all of this so you can understand where I'm coming from when I tell you that we absolutely would not be able to, to stay on plan OAP1 if the monthly cost is increased. Likewise, if we switch to plan OAP2, like the proposal will encourage us to do so, uh, we'll not be able to keep up with increased deductibles or the cost of medications. Moving forward with these proposed medical coverage changes will create more stress and the possibility of a financial nightmare for my family. As I stand here before you, I don't just represent my family. I represent my other brothers and sisters that are sitting and standing behind us. I represent the 19-year-old who just started his career. He hopes to get married and start a family during his 36 years serving this city. Should he have to wonder how or if he'll be able to do that based on a medical bill that he will incur 
with his new deductibles that he might not have time to save up for. I represent the 53-year-old captain who has served our city selflessly for 31 years. He has planned on retiring in two years to take care of his ailing wife, but due to the new 50-50 medical care costs, he can't afford to retire. He deserves to, but he can't. I represent the 65-year-old retired battalion chief. He sacrificed his back, his knees, and his time for 26 years to serve the city honorably, only to be told that with the new proposed health care changes, he is no longer considered one of us, and that he should just get Medicare and move on. Here in Independence, we adopted a new logo right behind you that says, Independence, a great American story. We have a very rich past, but you are writing the story of our future. The question is, what will you write? Besides having the honor to work for my city as a firefighter, I also have the profound privilege to serve the fire department and our retirees as the department chaplain. Along with my other duties, I believe it's my responsibility to share that I truly believe that each one of us will be held accountable for our actions and our decisions towards all people, both positive and negative, at the end of our days. This is one of those moments in time that we can show our true character. I believe that you will make the right choice. I believe that you will see the faces and remember the names of all the hardworking employees of this city that are relying on you to help us care for our families. Please choose somewhere else to get your numbers to balance the budget. Please allow us to do our jobs without the fear and financial hardships that these proposed changes will create. Please choose to make this a chapter worth remembering and both, at a, both now at election time and in the future for Independence's great American story. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> yeah, a tough act to follow is right. <laughs> Madam Mayor, City Council, uh, my name is Joseph Blanco. I am the president of Local 6360 for the Communication Workers of America. I have the privilege and the honor to represent the dispatchers for 911. I won't go over a lot of the points that have already been made. I think they were well said. But I do want to bring a couple points that my members have brought to me that I think I should express to you. One, I know that the, the, the city manager has stated that they will revisit some of these issues, and I think that's very important because my members have asked that I address this issue with you in regards to their health care. We already know the sacrifices that you have made in the past, but we also want to make sure you understand the sacrifices that the dispatchers have made to help coordinate the fire and the police department. Their sacrifices have been great, and you, Mayor, have known our struggles from getting from one point to another. These cuts, if they're implemented, would devastate a lot of my members and some of our retirees that are on fixed incomes, as previously stated. All I ask is that you reconsider what's going to be reproposed to you and hope that we can be able to find what needs to be found to take care of these issues that we have. I would also like to ask that you know that with the sacrifices that we've been making here and that the obvious sacrifices that you're trying to make as well, we know that it's going to be tough, but we cannot expect our employees, our members, to subsidize these cuts and expenditures that you're trying to put forth today. Please find it in your heart to make these changes where necessary so that we don't have these increases. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, I'm Steve Cook. I'm president of FOP Lodge One. I'm not going to take up a bunch of your time, but I'm going to kind of approach things from a little bit of a, I guess, a different angle than everybody else has. As I'm sure you all know, nobody wants to be a police officer nowadays. That's something that's kind of been going on over the past eight to ten years. It's gotten progressively worse. The problem is we still have the same amount of agencies that need qualified officers, but we have a smaller pool to select from. The benefit that we've always had in independence is our, our benefits. That's why we get people from Blue Springs, Lee Summit, Grain Valley, you know, different agencies, even Kansas City, wanting to come over here and work because our benefits are so good. And they recognize that, yeah, you may have to work a little bit harder over here, uh, more calls for service, you know, maybe sometimes the equipment's not where it needs to be because we have other priorities that have to be handled, but they know they're going to be taken care of benefit-wise. 
And that's always been an important selling point. If that's taken away from us, we have nothing. We have nothing to offer. I'll just be candid with you. Uh, I've got at least 10 people, my members, that have came to me that said, what's my motivation to stay? There's other agencies that are on loggers that pay more than we do right now that do a, a half the work that we're doing. So why would I stay here if I don't have this? And I can understand that thought process. Going along with that, our crime, especially our gun crime in Independence right now, it's on the uptick. Uh, we're starting to see more and more of the heroin overdoses, things like that. I spent my last three days in here on overtime working felon in possession cases and working a case for an individual uh, that did die of a heroin overdose trying to get the guys responsible for supplying him. So <clears throat> my point being is we can only do so much with what we have and we all agree that we do need more police officers, but we're not going to get more police officers if we don't have something to offer to them. And the ones that we do have are going to continue to go. And at some point, we're going to hit a crisis. And, and I, I appreciate the fact a lot of the things that the city's doing and trying to do and things that they're trying to implement, uh, you know, the uptown market, different things to make the city more attractive. And that's great. But if you don't have public safety, who's going to want to come here if it's not safe, if there's crime? So <clears throat> so, you know, and I, I've had some you know, Zach and I have had some great conversations. I, I, I respect him. Uh, I, I do believe that he listens. And I do believe that you all have good hearts and that you listen too. And I think you do want what's best for the city. And the changes that are being proposed, they aren't what's best for the city or for anybody. So I just like you to, to think about that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody see me? <laughs> I'm not I'm not blinding anybody. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm Chris Roars. I've lived in Independence for 64 years. My entire 37-year career as a firefighter was here in Independence. I've lived here in Independence as a retiree for the past nine years. Tonight, I'm here to speak as the representative of the members of the Loggers Retirees Group which is comprised of retired employees and their spouses from the City of Independence. Just one year ago, I was here speaking to you on behalf of the same group of people asking that a proposal offered by the City Manager to change how the health care premiums are split between the retirees and the City not be implemented. You agreed with our request and voted to have the premium split remain as it was. We appreciated your decision and thought that the matter was over. Unfortunately, that was not the case. We are back here again for something that not only revives last year's undesirable proposal, but adds to it and then multiplies it exponentially. My question to you and my concern is why? Why do we continually have to come here and basically beg for what is rightfully ours? What you as our employer promise to us as your employees. As employees, we worked for wages below the area standard and accepted this benefit in lieu of higher wages. We did our jobs as required and many, if not most, did more. We're not here asking for more. We're here asking that what was promised to us continue to be given to us. We are asking that you keep your promise with honor and comply with the terms you agreed upon. We are senior citizens and most are on fixed incomes. Most of us struggle with day-to-day -day expenses and must make hard decisions as to what to do with our money. They made their decision to retire based on what they had been promised, including but not limited to their loggers retirement, social security income, Medicare, and stay well health insurance which once again is now under fire. They must make ends meet. Their expenses can't exceed their income, so they carefully weigh whether the expense is a need or simply a desire. <coughs> Shouldn't the city be doing the same thing? I would resoundingly say yes, but sadly that has not been the case. The city spends money they don't have on projects they don't need and then claim they can't afford <laughs> Thank you. 
and then they claim they can't afford the expenses they have already incurred for the things they do need and have already committed to, i.e. stay well. We say that must stop. Stop creating new expenses. Keep your commitments for the expenditures you have already promised and incurred. The health care plan we now have, stay well, is what was promised and what we want. Nothing less, nothing more. We will not stand by idly while it is ripped from us. If you have revenue shortfalls, then find ways to increase revenue and ways to cut the fat. Stay well health care for the retirees is not fat. It is a commitment. It is a promise. It is a benefit that you gave to your most valuable asset, the employees, and it was promised by the city to be passed on to the retirees and who gave it their all to the end, the retirees. I would implore you not to make this change, to explore other options, to make up your shortfalls, and to continue in an honorable and committed fashion by keeping the problem promise that has already been made. I thank you. Mayor and Councilman and woman, <laughs> thank you for having me today. My name is Steve Hibbs. I'm a resident of Independence. Don't work for Independence, but a residence. I have friends that do, though. And this is uh, health care is important in our country, and it's very important to them, too. I'm asking you, and it sounds like with your uh, city manager, you guys are looking at making some different changes to, to make this work for everyone. And I'm asking the councilmen and women to look at it seriously because this was what has to happen. These are Americans. These are the people that work for independence. And uh, just like your sign says behind you, a great American story. We want to keep that going that way. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mike Johan. I'm a retired police officer. I started in 1977. I retired in 2012. I stayed on as a reserve officer. As some of you know, I work security here a lot of times, and I work at municipal court two days a week. I'm here on behalf, not just for myself and the retirees, but also the current employees. Uh, if, this, if these changes go through, first of all, I want to say I have no prepared speech. speech. This is coming from my heart, all right? I've talked to some of these girls that work back here in court, and they're crying. They're literally crying. You're talking about employees that make $14 an hour. They told me they can't, they live, some of them live paycheck to paycheck. And if this proposal goes through with family plans, $268 a month, they're going to do without insurance. It's that simple. They can't afford it. They're just going to have to do without insurance. And I told them that I'd come here and talk just because they couldn't do it. They're, they're too upset. But they just didn't have the it within them to come up and talk. And I told them I would come up here and let you know that this is personal. And you know, if you have some compassion, you need to think about a lot of these employees. The vast majority of employees only make forty-five thousand dollars and under. They're not making big salaries. I have a stepson that works with the street department. He makes fourteen twenty an hour. He can't afford this insurance. He's got a baby on the way. He cannot afford. $268 a month increase. If so, he's going to do without insurance, and I'm assuming you're going to be putting employees on Medicaid, because that's what it sounds like to me is going to happen. Because people can't afford the, the lower paid employees cannot afford this. It's just not possible. And I really hope that, that you are working and trying to get this resolved or, or finding a place to cut somewhere, because this isn't feasible for, for the lower paid employees. The higher paid employees, they can absorb it. Now, they might not like it, but at least they can absorb it and go on with their life. The lower paid employees, they're probably going to have to leave or, you know, maybe, I don't know if that's what you want or not. They're going to have to leave and find a, a, a better paying job or, or some, some place that gives them some better insurance because those rates just, it's not affordable for the lower paid employees. Uh, I'm also speaking for retirees. Let me just give you, give you an example. 
maybe you don't know how our retirement system works, but like, like my case, or in everybody's case, we get 2% per year for every year we work. So I, I was a public employee, I retired at 50, or public safety, so I retired at 55 because you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's a young man's game, really, to be honest with you out on the streets anymore. You're fighting these people that are doped up on meth and heroin and everything else. You know, you really don't want a 65-year-old man out there fighting these people. You know, your, 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 your workman's comp is going to skyrocket. <laughs> Anyway, your workman comp claims, they're going to skyrocket. Just mark my words, it will happen because as you get older, you know, the, the rotator cuff tears, your, your ace, you know, those things just don't work like they used to. And you're out there fighting these people hyped up on drugs, and they don't feel nothing. So, and, and you can hire younger employees at, at a lot less rate, and I would think you could save a lot of money there because I know there's about a $30,000 a year difference from a top police officer to a starting police officer. There's $30,000 a year right off the bat, and that's not even counting the, the, pay, the payroll tax you have to pay, the Social Security tax. So let me get back to, our, to our, our retirement plan. Let me explain it to you. Most people retire at 60%, maybe 65%. 2% per year. Most people work 30, 32 years, maybe a few more. And you only get 89% of your pay. When, when, at the very, you know, when you're working, because you pay 7% Social Security, 4% for your pension. So you're only getting, they collecting 89% of your pay when you're working. So take someone like me, for instance, I retired at 64%. So I retired, based on my budget, 25% pay cut, knowing that I'm going to be making 25% less than I was making. And I planned on that. <laughs> and, I, and I prepared because I didn't know that the rug was going to be pulled out from beneath me. And if this, these, if this goes into effect, my rate goes from $384 to $1,000 a month. Okay, that's an equivalent to a 15% pay cut in my pension. So now I'm going from 64% to 49% of what I made. And that's just me. Count everybody else in here. Everybody's going to be going to about under 50% of what they were making. And you're expecting them to make it because it's, it's just like it was spoken earlier. I started here in 77, and I, you know, everybody told me, get out, go to Kansas City, go to a big department, and you can make so much more money, you can be retired in 20, 25 years, but the benefits is what kept me here. That's what kept me here is the benefits, because it was assured that when I retired at 55, I have health insurance, and I, and I can retire. And that's how I based my whole retirement on, was that I was going to have this, and now it goes from 384 to $1,000 a month in three years. And that, that's just, that's a big burden on people. And I'm blessed, I made a little bit more money than, than $45,000 a year. A lot of people don't. And let me tell you something, there's people that, at least I'm blessed, I'm still healthy, I thank the Lord, he's blessed me, I can still get out and work. But there's people that sacrifice in this city throughout the departments from power and light, working on the, on, the, on, the, on the poles, climbing up and down, hurting themselves, fire department, going in and hailing all that smoke and getting cancers and whatever else they get and all the injuries they get. And then you have policemen and that, that get hurt like Tom. He can't go out and work another job and make up this difference. That, he can't do that. So, so anyway, I'm blessed. I can get out and work, hopefully. But you know, as you well know, as you get older, nobody knows how long you're going to be healthy. You know, something could happen overnight. You, nobody has that assurance. But at least right now, I can make up the difference. But a lot of people can't. They're permanently disabled, and they sacrifice for this city. I sacrifice for this city. I don't know how many times I came in on a weekend and worked a homicide and didn't go home till Monday evening. I'd get called in on a Friday. I worked in the detective unit. I remember many a times getting called, because a lot of homicides happen on Friday nights, needless to say. Get called in on a Friday night at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'd go home maybe Monday afternoon, Monday evening, after we worked the whole weekend without sleep, because you know, once the leads start rolling, you've got to go. 
you got to follow up on the leads. You got to get search warrants. You got to get moving. You can't stop because the first 40, you know, you've seen the show 48 hours. The first 48 hours is so critical. And I, I worked many a weekends not even seeing my family for the weekend because I'm up here doing a service for the city trying to get a bad person off the street. And then this is the thanks I get, you know, a, a, almost a $600 a month increase when I was promised and guarantee, well, I guess they're not a guarantee, but promise something. Every year. And I, I just felt compelled to, to kind of explain to you how this pension works. And, and, and one more thing about it. Like I said, most employees make under $45,000. So let's just use the figure $40,000. Somebody in another department, say street department or wherever, works 30 years, get 60% of $40,000, so that's $24,000. Well, they leave their wife or their spouse on the insurance and, on, and they give them 50% of their pension when they die. So when they pass away, their spouse is now down to $12,000 a year. And you're expecting to, for these people to pay that kind of money because a lot of the older people, you know, I'm talking people in their late 70s eight, eight, and, and in their 80s, they didn't retire at 2% like I did. They retired at 1.5%. So they're making a whole, whole lot less than I am. And I don't know how they're going to afford it. You're, I mean, I, I'm assuming that a lot of people are just going to have to go get some government aid or something, you know, get on food stamps or whatever it takes. Because with these increases, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I know that Mr. Councilman Huff probably understands how the pension system works. But some of you, maybe you didn't know that till tonight. Because when, when you, like I said, some people have been housewives, you know, some ladies have been housewives and their husband worked at the fire department or street department or wherever, and then they leave them half their pension. That's, that's generally what they leave them, is half. And like, like I said, even if they, say they made 50,000 and they worked 30, 30 years. So that's 60% of 50,000, there's 30,000. And then they pass away and leave their spouse with 15,000, and you're expecting them to pay these high rates? I, I just think it's wrong. I mean, anyway, do you have any questions on, on how the pension system works? Or <laughs> no? I think I've covered everything. I'm sure I have forgot something, but I, I just felt compelled to come up here and talk to you all to try to explain to you the the, the pain it's going to cause a lot of people. And Why doesn't the public know? I'm, I'm a public citizen. Why hasn't the public been informed? I depend on myself. I this is, why. excuse me, sir, this is the public hearing. So if you'd like to come up and speak, you can come and speak. But this is our, you know, our opportunity to let the public know. But. I, I'm imploring you as a council, I, I, and I, you know, I'm sorry, but when there's been times in my life when I was younger, I had budget crisis because I started as a young police officer. Let me tell you what, they didn't pay nothing back then. I mean, it, the pay was ridiculous. And when I had a budget crisis, I didn't spend money I didn't have. That was just that simple. I, I mean, I can remember borrowing $5 from somebody to, to eat the day before payday. And, and if we're in a budget crisis, why are we having a larger budget? You know, why are we, why are we trying to add people to the payroll when we're in a budget crisis? And I'm glad you brought that up, Mr. Van Camp. I, I just think that it needs to be run like a, a family budget. When you're broke, you don't spend money. You cut back. Anyway, that's, uh, uh, the, the, I, that's pretty much the last thing I had to say. So thank I thank you for your time, and I, I just hope that you, I hope the city and, and, and Mr. Walker and everybody can, can find a solution here. I mean, I'm all for it, and I, I'd be more than happy to be involved, and, and I want to be involved. The city's been good to me. I don't want to sit there and take anything away from the city. The city has been good to me. I was born here in Independence, raised in Independence, raised my family in Independence. I live in Independence. I have nothing but good things to say about Independence. It's been great until we start getting something yanked from us that we were assured that we were going to have. 
So anyway, I ask for your compassion when you, when you all decide, have to decide on this to think about the real pain it's going to cause people. Because it's going to cause people, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of serious pain. So please think about that. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Lucy Young, 2320 Viking Drive, Independence, Missouri. We moved here when my husband retired from the military because this was such a wonderful town. The employees were great for the citizens, and they gave up raises every year. Management got zero raise every year, year after year after year. In lieu of that, they got from the original city manager prior to Mr. Blick a good health care plan. This was part of the deal. They knew they weren't going to be making as much as they could at the county or Kansas City or an industry, and they chose to work here because of the benefit. Now, I've sat up there. I've gone through all these numbers. I've served with one of you. We have this issue come up reoccurring. When I get my gas bill, I know my gas bill has to be paid. When I get my electric bill, I know my electric bill has to be paid. Otherwise, they'll be shut off. You need to think about this health care as that type of expense, that it has to be paid. These people are entitled. They earned it through, I remember when we had to furlough people because our budget was so impacted. We don't need to go back to those days. You need to strip it back down to the basics. And one of the basics is employee health care to keep good employees in this city. I just want to say I'm a citizen. I live in Independence. I live off 40 Highway and Lee Summit Road. I called Mr. Van Camp today, and I called Zachary Walker today because yesterday I heard from a friend what was happening to him. I used to have 65 employees in my new car dealership, and before I paid myself, I made sure I took care of all my employees first. They came first because without them, I didn't have a business. When people dial 911, they want a police officer to respond now. It's an emergency may not be in your mind, but in our mind, it's an emergency. We wouldn't have called 911. And I depend on all these guys here to put their lives in the life on the line to keep me safe. And I, I don't know why the public wasn't told. If the public knew what was going on, and you gave us taxpayers an opportunity, said you need another one cent per dollar or one cent sales tax, the public would vote this in. But nobody's told the public. I called today a 100 of my friends and asked them if they knew what was going on, and nobody did. I called Channel 5 and Channel 4, and neither one of them showed up for this meeting until I'm, you're asking the police officer to basically take between a $5,400 to $10,000 a year cut in pay, and nobody can afford to do that in this economy. Nobody can. And yet the public wasn't told about this. I talked to you on the phone today when I had to hang up on you today, Mr. Van Camp, and told you there was another person on the line. It was Zachary Walker. I called you on your cell phone. You don't even remember. We had, a, we had a quite, a, uh, quite a conversation today, sir. Me and you on the phone today, and I was very polite to you. And I told you where I lived, and I asked. I'm sorry. Excuse me for a minute. Um, our council rules, rules of procedure do indicate that you're not supposed to address individual council members. This is an opportunity well, I'm, for I, you to address I apologize. the council as a whole. That's okay. I apologize. I've never done this before. To the entire council. I, I don't believe anybody could forget you. Yeah. OK. <laughs> But all I'm saying is, if you let us taxpayers know what's going on, which step forward? Police officers can't be political, but I can. This sounds like the same thing Nancy Pelosi pulled. First, we've got to pass the bill to find out what's in it. And then once we pass it, we're going to exempt ourselves from it. Give us a chance to take care of our, our boys in blue. I back the boys in blue and the fire department and every city employee. I'm Paul Shorty, that's all I want to tell you.
Thank you for hearing us talk today. Um, as you all know, my name is Stacy Wagstaff. Um, my husband, Tom Wagstaff, was shot. He worked 16 years for Independence Police, um, and it darn near cost his life. As many of these firefighters and police officers go out every day and they risk their lives for independence because they believe in their job. They believe in what they're doing. I just ask that you think about how you're showing them you appreciate them when you think about our health care. Good evening again. My name is Grant Watkins Davis. I spoke earlier. Um, I, while I'm not a city employee, I think I have a unique perspective to offer because I'm probably the youngest person in this room. And I do want to live in independence for the rest of my life. These changes won't have a drastic effect on the quality of city services right away because there's a lot of great people who are already working for the city and are already committed and won't be able to move other places. But there's going to be a huge issue with hiring new people if we make these kinds of cuts. There are three reasons why people go in to public service. Duty, the benefits that it offers, and the stability. And duty doesn't pay the bills. So we need to take care of our employees so that good people, skilled and qualified individuals will continue to want to work in independence. If we don't do that, then it doesn't matter how many new police officers a budget adds or how many new taxes we pass to hire more people, the best people are going to go other places. And eventually, we're going to live in a place where a lot of the employees are not qualified or they just don't care because they have to work an extra job or they have to work tons of overtime or they're not able to afford their medications and their health care to keep themselves in a place where they can properly do their jobs. So as someone who wants to live here for the rest of my life, this is deeply concerning to me. If you really want to look out for the long-term future of independence, past when all of you will be gone, then you should not make changes like this because it will affect your children, your grandchildren, and the people that come after them. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else wishing to speak at the public hearing? Okay, this public hearing is closed. Um, we're just going to take a five minute break. Um, and then we'll come right back and proceed. Um, I want to recognize our um, Citizens Academy members who are here when we get back, and then we'll move on to our um, ordinances and first readings.
mean, are they city residents? Back to order. I go for it. I know. Um, okay. We will, um, before we move on to our ordinances this evening, um, because we, it's, you know, already starting to be a long night, I want to go ahead and recognize um, the members of our Citizens Academy. This is a program we started last year. Um, and did a pilot program and then can, it was so popular and successful we d decided to do it again this year um, and tonight is the last night of the 2019 Spring Citizens Academy. So what this um, program does is we select um, a number of citizens from who applied to be a part of this and they go through really kind of a backstage pass to the city of independence and really learn a lot about um our state departments and of course as we see tonight you know the dedicated employees who make this city run so it's a nine-week program and each week um, it featured a speaker and information showcasing um, one of the city departments and um, really gain, I think, a great understanding about what um, it takes to make this city work. Um, so there were things, I mean, I learned about the budget, emergency services, um, police, the canine unit toured our water production plant, interacted with dozens of uh, elected officials and our city staff. So I'd like to take a moment tonight um, to, did you all get a diploma <laughs> um, to recognize the participants that are here and thank you for showing such a great interest in your city and participating in this program. We are really eager to hear um, what your experience was like and recommendations about how to construct the next Citizens Academy. Um, so if you're here tonight, if I call your name, if you just stand up, we'd like to recognize you. Dan O'Neill, Jerry Atkins, Tim Sheehan, Richard Kelleher, Ross Wiley, Jim Turner, Darla Cardenas, is that correct? Um, John Strapic, Evelyn Bray, Dora Reed, Lupe Moy, Gail Hodges, Larry Brenner, Janetta Bolch, and Angelica Brown, Carol Donna Ashley, and Vera Harrison. Thank you. They're all over here except for Jerry, who's over here. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very, very much and, um, for participating, and thanks for being here tonight. Um, we will move on now, Madam City Clerk, with our ordinances this evening. The following bills will receive their second and final reading. Bill number 19027, an ordinance amending Chapter 8, Article 6, Purchases and Sales, Section 2, Section 3, Section 4, and Section 7. Is there any discussion on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Madam Mayor. Councilman Van Camp. I'd like to... Uh, I move to postpone indefinitely Bill 19028. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Did, uh, did we wake you up? Yeah. <laughs> was it? Did, did, did you uh, come to life here? I said, Thank you. It's a little noisy. It's hard to hear down here. Um, okay, it's been moved and seconded um, to postpone indefinitely 19028. Is there any discussion? Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Uh, motion passes. Um, 19029. <laughs> Bill number 19029, an ordinance imposing a use tax at the rate of two and one quarter percent for the privilege of storing, using, or consuming within the city any article of tangible personal property 
pursuant to the authority granted by the state of Missouri and subject to the provision of sections 144.600 through 144.761 RSMO, providing for the use tax to be repealed, reduced, or raised in the same amount as any city sales tax is repealed, reduced, or raised, and providing for submission of the proposal to the qualified voters of the city for their approval at the special election called and to be held in the city on August 6, 2019, and proposing the form of the ballot to be employed at said election and directing the city clerk to do all things called for by law in connection with the holding of said election. Okay, and Councilman Robertson had uh, provided an amendment um, that he wanted to bring forward for consideration this evening. Councilman? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm trying to get my <laughs> microphone to work. Um, yes, I would like to amend this ordinance, and it only amends a couple sentences in the ordinance, but basically what it does is it increases um, the number of police that will be funded up to a total of 30 police officers. Um, and as an example, this, this ordinance, this use tax, then will fund, first of all, the animal shelter, as one bucket, 50%, and the police up to 30 officers first. And once that is funded, then anything else that's accumulated through the use tax goes automatically over like a waterfall into the uh, general fund, uh, which um, it potentially can. We don't think it will at this point, but I foresee in the next few years that the use tax income, and, and we really don't know, we don't have any good basis for prediction, but I expect it to fully fund both of these things within the next three to five years, and then after that, any extra income that might be provided from the collection of that use tax would help offset some of the general fund expenses, including um, everything else here, the codes, the other funding of the police and, and fire and, and everything else that's part of the general fund that we're seeing a slow erosion of the funding for because of the decrease in sales tax over the years. So this is basically the same ordinance with just a few sentences changed to include that waterfall overflow once those two buckets of funds are fully funded. I, I do want to add that both of these funds will be administered and looked at by a citizens committee, not the council, so they will oversee the funding in each of those two buckets of funds. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. If I could have a second. Okay, so there's a motion to amend. Is there a second? Yes, there's a second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion on the motion to amend? Uh, Madam Mayor, just yes, a point. Uh, I didn't get to see this. I mean, I mean, what we're saying is here is that we're adding last minute things without discussion again, I mean, at, at, at a place. I'm not saying that this isn't valid, but I'm saying what we're looking at is to not, not be transparent, that we should look at everything ahead of schedule uh, a little bit uh, and have these. I mean, we're, we got a thing on the, calendar tonight, the agenda tonight, to uh, not have any last minute stuff. And this is one of those things that I, th my only fear here is, is going to the people because it was voted out last time and I want it to work this time. All right. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm for this because I have studied it and seen that the uh, implications of what it is what I'm being said here. but. I would like it to be more in the future transparent we are, to the people. Um, we do have a deadline if we are to put this on the ballot for August. It does need to be to the election board before five o'clock on next Tuesday. So um, I know Councilman Roberson had um, distributed his amendment to the council last week and made some adjustments, some you know, fairly minor adjustments, I would say, um, to the intent of that um, amendment. So I just wanted to make Madam. that statement. Yes, Councilman. So the original ordinance, 19029, this is the second reading. So it's been two weeks. We've had it for two weeks. And, and my amendment I got out last week, this, this last week, 
Um, the only thing I changed tonight was from 10 officers to 50 officers. So that, that was the only change Third. tonight. You have it right over there. And, and I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, what I'm saying, though, that that's a significant change. And uh, we're always under a deadline. And I understand. And that's what the original uh, rule that we had of the change that you implemented to get the AMI. That's why we had it, so that we were able to get in something at a last minute that had to be done. Uh, if we're going to change that, I think we should change uh, or at least take a look at bringing forth these things in a more transparent from 20 to 30 or 50 to 60 or 80 to 2. Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman. Um, I believe this is Councilman uh, Roberson. When did you pass this information out? Um, I or, believe it was Thursday. I, was I that through was, email? Um, it, it was passed out with the agenda. It went out with the agenda, and it was put in your box on Thursday. Right. I was trying to remember. I read so much email, but yeah. So we've we've had this discussion, and we've we've talked about it. We've brought it up here, uh, too. Um, you have the, the copy here. I think this is quite appropriate for what we are doing. Um, I don't have any problem moving forward and voting in favor of this. I think this is very much needed. And I do believe it actually addresses a little bit of the concerns that was brought forward tonight. Uh, so I'm looking forward to voting in favor and putting this on the ballot. I do have a question, Mr. City Manager. Yes, ma'am. This has been a change. Our prior um, proposal was that we would not reduce the regional animal shelter budget be, be below 750,000 for 10 years, nor will we reduce the number of sworn police officers below the current level for 10 years. This new one has made the change that we will add 30 additional police officers. And I had not seen this new one until I reached the dais tonight. So for the first time, can you please tell the citizens how much will these 30 new officers cost this city? 30 new officers is going to be in the ballpark of about three to three and a half million dollars. And Proposition P, be it under this amendment or the prior one, the funding for the regional animal shelter is anticipated to be $1.7 million. Is that correct? That. Uh, includes that would be the all-in package for animal services in the city including our current code and uh, code for animal control services that the city presently administers and where is the difference of nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars coming from to fund the animal shelter regionally uh, so right now the city contributes roughly five hundred and sixty five thousand dollars towards that um, we have a definitive one-year solution, which is the financial uh, commitment that the county's putting in. Uh, there's still a few dollars that are put in uh, the second year. Uh, beyond two years, uh, that's going to require the kind of conversations we've been having tonight about where this ranks among uh, our many, many priorities. So the city, I'm sorry, the county's going to pay us $240,000 for the land that we voted last week. That's right. The county's going to pay us $100,000 to operate the shelter in one year, for one year. Uh-huh. So that's $340,000, and we have budgeted $587,000 in our budget, correct? Um, that, that's a good enough, close enough number. Okay. My math says that's $927,000. Is it not true that this regional animal shelter is going to take care of animals outside the city of Independence? Uh, the, we, under our agreement with the county, will house uh, animals uh, for unincorporated Jackson County. And that includes animals outside the city of Independence, correct? Yes. And this use tax is on the city of Independence residents, correct? Uh, it would be levied on anyone purchasing goods online uh, within the Independence municipal boundaries. So $1.7 million less $927,000. Where is the balance of that money coming from? Is it coming from our city? For the first year, no. The county uh, helps defray that. For the second year, uh, the city's going to have to identify additional resources. And then year two and beyond, uh, that full gap would be on the city. Thank you. OK, is there any further discussion on the motion to amend? 
Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? No. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Uh, motion passes. Um, is there any further discussion on the ordinance as amended? Madam Mayor, I am of course going to vote no on this ordinance, and I'm going to vote no because there's almost a million dollar deficit that we are asking this city, our citizens, to pick up that cost. And this is 10 minutes after we've heard from dedicated employees that we are cutting their insurance costs. I am, not, I am not saying I don't think we should run an animal shelter. I am saying we didn't put an RFP out to see who else would run the shelter for us. We did not seek a, a cheaper shelter, but we have simply gone down a path where the prior council made a mistake. We made a bad deal with the county and we are just making it worse by entering into a Proposition P. And I do want to find a way to run an animal shelter that we can afford. We cannot afford this shelter. Our citizens 18 months ago voted no on a use tax, 62 to 38 percent. We are rushing into this use tax because the county has forced us to deal with something by July 1 when Great Plains leaves. Their emergency does not mean I have to act irresponsibly. I am not going to act irresponsibly. I am voting no. This, this uh, uh, ordinance here is just saying that we're going to let the people vote on this. Councilman. And the people I don't know the terms of the ballot language. The ballot language doesn't explain all the nuances, as they never do. Madam Mayor, yes. I appreciate your passionate comments. I, I wonder where they've been over the past months that we've been discussing this. I oh, wait a minute. It, oh, no. If, if I may, uh, we've had executive sessions, and I don't recall you bringing all of these ideas to the, to the forefront. Excuse me, didn't I say Taj Mahal animal shelter? Wasn't that said more than once in, a, in an executive session? by me do not sit here sir and tell me this is the first time you hear i am against proposition p because if it is i don't know where you've been no well, that's not the first time that you have said that because you're usually against everything so that's the given number two you've never given out the proposals at least to me or to the other council people that i can recall in executive sessions or other to where we should have looked at RFPs or other uh, ideas that you have brought forward. I don't recall hearing those debates with you, which I would love to have had. Those would have been good debates to, and good points of discussion. Don't recall them being brought forth in any type of executive session. But I appreciate your comments now. But thank you. Is there any further discussion? Yes, Councilman. You know, we've been put in a position by former councils um, with the relationship and the contract with Jackson County with the former shelter. Um, and unfortunately, because of the, the terms of SPC or the uh, Great Plains leaving, um, we've been put in a position to make a decision rather quickly and we haven't had time to do an RFP process and some of the other things that I think we should do and, and I think we still can do down the road. So at this point, we've got to move forward. It's part of the charter that we have to have an animal shelter. Uh, a animal uh, control, animal shelter is in the charter, I believe. Is, is that correct? No. No, I don't believe that it states that in the charter. We do, we are responsible for animal services. Animal services. And that can be provided so, in So yeah, ways. it talks yes. about animal services provided yes. in the charter. So um, without, without the shelter though, there won't be any animal services provided in our city. Um, the other cities around us have their own animal shelters. Uh, Liberty just passed their use tax to support their animal shelter and I think down the road even though we're going to stay in that facility which is is a very nice facility but unfortunately it's a very expensive facility 
that, uh, that we can look around. And this will give us probably at least a couple years to decide if we want to stay there or that we want to go through a process and look for another facility that maybe we can operate at a cheaper uh, expenses for the city. So I, I think there's options down the road, but I think right now we need to make this decision. Um, the use tax will potentially support that into the future as well as the police, and I think we do need to focus on that in, in future years. This won't fully fund it at first, but I think within the next five to ten years it will. So I am for this uh, amended ordinance. Any further discussion? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, we've made the appropriate moves to keep an animal shelter open. We may make other moves, but we've gone and talked in executive session, as the councilman is, is alluded to, because the people demand we have an animal shelter. You've seen them here and you've heard them here and we listened to them and we uh, acted appropriately. Now it may not be the best of circumstances, but it is what we're doing now to maintain the status quo. Any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Oh, there, we, need a, we need a motion for approval of the I, um, ordinance as amended. I will move approval of the amended ordinance. Second. I moved and seconded. Now please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? No. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Um, this takes us to our first readings this evening, and we do have one emergency um, ordinance regarding a final plat. Madam State Clerk. Um, these bills will receive their first reading this evening and their second reading on June 3rd. Bill number 19030, an ordinance approving the 2019 to 2020 annual action plan for program year 45, annual action plan for the CDBG and home programs, authorizing applications to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, for the Community Development Block Grant CDBG program year 45, and the Home Investment Partnerships Act home program year 25, authorizing execution of a written agreement and acceptance of CDBG and home program funds under the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 and making the necessary appropriations. Bill number 19031, an ordinance prohibiting the city from installing advanced metering infra infrastructure, AMI, entering into a contract for the purposes of installing AMI, and avoiding any, <coughs> excuse me, and voiding any contracts entered into as a result of the approval of non-ordinance action item number two, approved on April 1st, 2019. Madam Mayor. Yes. I have a, have a question, uh, maybe not to be answered tonight, but um, a question that can be answered before the second reading of this ordinance. Um, and it just has to do with the language that's in the, um, the ordinance itself. It talks about entering into a contract with any entity for purposes of installing AMI known as smart meters at any location within the city limits of independence or any customers of the municipally owned utilities. Uh, that would include the gas company which has already installed AMI and plans to upgrade their AMI in the city. And so I, I would like legal before the second reading next time to give us an opinion as to whether that uh, will cause a problem with the gas service company Spire and could cause us to be in legal jeopardy as a city or even the citizens of the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, this bill received two readings. Bill number 19505, an ordinance approving a final plat of Ansley apartment First plat at 19700 East 39th Place South in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri, and declaring an emergency. Bill number 19505, an ordinance approving a final plat of Ansley Apartment First plat at 19700 East 39th Place South in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri, and declaring an emergency. Is there any discussion on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Uh, ordinance passes. This takes us to uh, council member comments. I'll start on my right with council member Doherty. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Nothing tonight. I think we've had it all been said. <laughs> council member Perkins? Nothing tonight, Madam Mayor. 
Councilman Hawk? Nothing this evening. Councilmember DeLucy? Of course. Mr. City Manager, on Phelps Road over I-70, it's a brand new bridge, some of the fencing has fallen off and I know that the city has closed the sidewalks, but it's real easy to walk around that barrier. And I just wondered if perhaps we couldn't call the state and say, please hurry up and fix it. It's very dangerous. It's a dangerous situation. We'll place that call in the morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman Robertson. Nothing tonight, thank you. Councilman Van Camp. I, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I seen where uh, uh, SPP didn't have power and the came up to $1,200 a megawatt. Yes. It's uh, can only go up. I, it, it, all this based on getting cheap electricity is not going to last. We need to cover ourselves, not with supposed energy, rent receipts at the end of it, but with true and actual generation. Thank you. Um, Did you get a chance? A few things that I'd like to touch on tonight, um, and I guess I'll start with that, is um, we did approve moving forward with a contract for um, capacity. I don't believe that we have adequately addressed our need, our potential need for energy, Mr. City Manager, and I would like to further have the discussion about our potential future energy needs. Um, I did happen to receive, and maybe the rest of the council did also, the um, Southwest Power Pool annual report um, just a few days ago, incidentally. And um, it's actually quite interesting. And my I think the question that it lingers in my mind is we are continually reassured that we don't need to worry about energy because the Southwest Power Pool will provide that as a member of the pool that we're guaranteed that there will be energy um, when we need it. But they're getting it from somewhere. <laughs> I mean, they, the Southwest Power Pool, and it lists in their annual report um, their members who are independent power producers, including Dogwood. Um, so I would like um, to continue this discussion and um, as we continue to make decisions regarding Blue Valley and the service to our customers. And you know, now that we've made a decision on, um, or made a step in making a decision on capacity, um, I, I do think that we need to continue to have a discussion about energy as well. Um, so, you know, we can bring that forward maybe in a study session in June. I know we, I'd like to get through the budget and some other more, you know, pressing things first, but I don't want to forget to talk about that, about the energy needs as well. Um, what I, I mean, I want to thank everybody who came tonight and spoke. Um, these are big decisions, and we need your input to make the right ones, and we truly appreciate, I, speaking for myself, truly appreciate those who came forward, and I appreciate um, our city manager um, continuing to have these discussions with um, our employees so that we can make the right decisions. What I heard repeated a number of times tonight is the need to create new revenue. Um, and that is certainly a part of the equation. So I am very pleased that the council um, has approved letting the voters make the decision on Proposition P. It um, is an opportunity to create uh, new revenue for the city for um, some needs. And I appreciate Councilman Robertson uh, making the amendment to um, give us the opportunity if we, um, you know, if we get really unexpected huge gains from this use tax that we are able to use those um, funds in other ways to, for the needs of this community. Um, so thank you um, for that and it will be, an, a, you know, a, a good discussion with this community as we move forward towards that um, decision in August. Um, 
I think that's all I had this evening, Mr. City Manager. Did you have anything else? I would provide two updates to the council. Mm -hmm. uh, to earlier today at the meeting of the Jackson County Legislature, the uh, animal shelter agreement that was approved by this council last week was approved by that entity today. So that uh, portion of that conversation is now completed. Um, no. So <laughs> Christina is shaking her head. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's just have Christina come yeah. clarify that real quick. <laughs> I think there was a resolution of intent. What they did today, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Christina Heinen, Special Projects Manager for the City of Independence. Um, today what happened, the legislature did add it, um, but they needed to make sure that they had enough proper notice, so they are going to be voting on it on June 3rd. They would vote on it next week, but with the holiday, they went ahead and pushed okay. it to the next week. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, very quickly, um, uh, we have had a lot of questions about um, the proposed insurance changes, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're looking at scaling back two of those, um, but still looking to make modifications regarding the uh, Medicare eligible employees or uh, retirees. So we have three opportunities for folks to meet with our insurance provider this week. Um, Tuesday, tomorrow from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the Truman Memorial Building. This coming Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, for the um, police headquarters multi-purpose room. And again on Wednesday at noon at the Independence Utility Center in the conference room, which is room 117. Uh, these are open to uh, all city employees, all retirees, their spouses, their dependents, et cetera. But again, uh, with our uh, revised thought process, it'll be primarily focused on the Medicare uh, changes. Okay, very good. We're adjourned.